Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at my Faxitron X-Ray machine here that I've had for quite a few years, and you've seen me use it on the channel many times. It produces beautiful images, and it allows us to reverse engineer PCBs or look inside of packages during a lot of the repair works that we've been doing. Unfortunately, recently, it's been doing something rather unusual. First, when I turn it on, first couple of pictures or so, the pictures are all completely out of focus. They're fuzzy. And then after a while, maybe about 10 images or so, all of a sudden, everything becomes super sharp. Now, this particular one is equipped with the best sensor that this series came with, and it produces really nice images as a result of that. But of course, an X-ray machine doesn't have focusing optics, let's say, like you would have on a camera, which means that the source of the problem is most likely from the X-ray tube itself. Now, be warned that it is very dangerous to work on X-ray machines, not just because it has high voltages, but also because if you take it apart too much and then you want to run it, you will be exposed to X-ray, and that is, of course, quite bad. So please do not replicate this if you don't know what you're doing, and we'll take all the precautions. Let's take a look. Now here are some of the images the X-ray machine produces when it is out of focus. As you can see, these packages and PCBs have absolutely no fine features and these images are essentially useless. And after some time, it snaps into being focused. I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit about X-ray tubes themselves, how they're made, how they produce X-ray, but also how they're focused in a few different mechanisms. So here's a crude drawing of an X-ray tube. Now, in order to produce X-rays, you really need electrons accelerated through an electric field, and then you slam them into a tungsten plate, and that collision transfers into X-ray coming out of it. Of course, the whole thing needs to be in vacuum. So the system, from an architectural point of view, is not very complex, but there's a lot of art in making the tube, of course. So here's an example of how that can be done. You have essentially a filament, and once you heat up a filament, you get thermionic emissions. That happens all the time. Every time you heat up a tungsten filament, for example, you're going to get a lot of electrons. But these electrons can then be further focused towards the target using a focusing cathode, which is voltage controlled in this situation. And this allows the electrons to just go directly towards where you want them to go, rather than scatter all around inside the tube. Now, once they're accelerated through this electric field, which can be tens to hundreds of thousands of volts, they slam really hard against this tungsten plate, and then X-rays get produced in all directions. But the angle of this tungsten plate makes a really big difference. And even though there is some scattering inside the tube, the majority of them are going to go through a little window that's built around the housing of the tube. The rest of it is typically made of some lead container so that you don't get emissions in all directions. Not all tubes do that, which is why it's important to make sure that you don't play around with tubes that you don't fully understand, because it could be emitting from all directions. Now, the collisions of the electrons to the tungsten plate will heat it up, and that's one of the reasons why it is made of tungsten, so it can have a very high melting temperature. And people put rotors and essentially a motor around it to spin it around, and by spinning it around, you keep cooling it, because the places where the electrons are colliding with the tungsten keeps getting refreshed, essentially. Now, you can play a lot of other tricks that to focus a tube like this. And in some situations, people even use more than one filament. So if you use a big filament, you're going to get a, a wide aperture where the electrons are produced. And if you use a smaller one, you get less of them, but you get a more focused point of electron creation. On the other side, you can have the angle of the anode changing. And depending on the angle, you can see that you can adjust the, the cone of the X-ray that would come out. These techniques are essentially mechanical, meaning that you either turn this filament on or this filament on to change the focus, or you just rotate the anode or just use two different ones to get the focus you want. But that's not the only way, as I said, in these focusing cathodes, and you can have plates that are electrostatically charged, and you can use electric fields to push the electrons in the direction you want. Or you can use more classical methods by using a, a magnetic field, by creating a coil and, you know, cathode ray tubes in the old televisions essentially use this technique to move the electron to exactly where you want them to be. Now, moving the electron and focusing them aren't necessarily the same thing. So something must be happening in the focusing circuitry of our tube that is not working anymore. There must be some voltages or current produced somewhere on the board that moves the electrons around and focuses it. And that circuitry just all of a sudden comes online and it enables the focusing. So we have to go and open the machine and take a look. And here's a nice example of an X-ray tube image I found online. This is not the tube that's inside this machine, of course, but this illustrates that point quite nicely, too. So we do have the terminals here to both pass the current as well as put the high negative voltage here. 
on the cathode and then there is a filament in here which creates electrons. They hit this plate and then x-ray comes all the way out here towards the target that you want and this needs to have a complete housing and this thing can rotate of course. This doesn't show any focusing elements that I can see although there does seem to be some focusing cup here behind the filament. So having said all of this I think the next thing we really have to do is to understand how our machine performs focusing. Now with the top of the unit removed, we have access to all the critical things we need about the X-ray controller itself. We have the main power supply, the X-ray controller board, as well as the X-ray power supply, and the tube are all under here, which we will take a look. And there's one board in here, which interfaces to the front of the instrument with all the numbers and the keypads and everything, as well as a few other lines going into this. So there's probably some processor on there, the main brain of this thing. Now to control the X-ray itself, you really only need an RS-232 port at the back of the unit. The sensor is entirely independent and it sits at the bottom of the instrument with a USB port going in the back. So you can buy this with different kinds of sensors or you can even buy one without any sensor at all and just have the x-ray tube. You can use a film in that case, which is not very convenient. So those units are really not that valuable. There are a bunch of screws over here which I've already removed and some holes here which I've labeled after I had removed this so we can see what potentiometers are underneath. So a few other potentiometers in here as well. If I remove that, it's a fairly heavy and thick piece of metal and it's really important because this cage is what's protecting you against the stray x-ray the tube is producing and there are multiple levels of protection here so first this top panel of course and then we have another warning here is that if you re remove this one you really shouldn't run the tube because it's going to have emit x-ray from the top of the unit which you definitely want to avoid the high voltage power supply is also over here and the cable is going in here control this entire thing so I suspect our problem is most likely on this board as this board is the one that directly interfaces to the x-ray tube. These are security screws, we'll have to find a way to remove them, but generally I wouldn't even run this uh, without this on top of it if I ever turn it on. That's probably why these holes are here, so you can easily access these potentiometers. There are a lot more potentiometers here that are holes in on top of this, so some of them probably don't need direct access. Interesting also to see how the fan is handled. So this is a fan over here, metallic body, another piece of metal directly in front of it to avoid stray x-rays coming out this way, and there's of course another metal cover on top of this. No interlock switches on any of this, which is a little bit unusual because there are interlock switches on the doors and on the sensor compartment, but not up here. A little bit weird in that sense. There's a couple of terminals in here to measure the kilovolt bias of the actual tube, as well as the milliamp current through the, get the filament of the tube. So you can measure that to make sure they're correct from the outside and probably adjust them through here. But I'm going to try and see if I can remove these to make sure that the only thing on the other side is just a tube as well. But we most likely don't have to touch the tube, it's just an issue of this controller board. And with the safety screws removed, we can remove the top panel. Keep in mind that everything is powered off, nothing is even plugged in. And it's really important again to work on these things. And here's our main tube, looking really nice. Here's the high voltage input with a Teflon bracket going through the metal piece over here. And that ensures, of course, there is no arcing as this thing can go up to 35 kilovolts or so. We do have a few cables over here to control the tube itself. The filament as well as the focusing lines must be coming from there and the fan over here to cool the tube as the tubes do get hot as we talked about earlier. Now we don't, we don't really need to do anything in this case so we can actually put this thing back but the, everything is controlled over here and these lines are feeling a bit soft and silicone like so they most likely are high voltage too and there is a couple of modules in here which I suspect are high voltage modules which means this thing is voltage focused. So that is a good sign which means the focusing is indeed handled by this so we can take this a step further. And here's the main Faxitrine X-ray tube controller board that has everything to turn on the tube, control the heater, control the current as well as do the focusing. Now I spend a little bit of time trying to reverse engineer it to some extent understand at least what is roughly connected to what. Now we know that the problem we have is intermittent so we can only really look for things that could potentially be intermittent. Things like broken connections and some of the other components that are there as well as the high voltage power supplies that are on here which we'll take a look at. We do have some voltages coming from these two orange connectors on both sides and we have some control as well as some analog voltages coming in here which is important and then we do have these three high voltage gamma high voltage power supply modules there they are 12 volt DC 1.5 kilovolt DC at the output and these are interesting units because they do have a linear relationship between the input and the output so essentially you can sweep the input from 0 to 12 volts roughly and the output would sweep essentially up to 1.5 kilovolt and there are different versions of this at different voltages now looking at some of the solder mask written over here and taking a hint of these potentiometers, it is obvious that there is some analog voltage generated from a different board. So there must be a DAC somewhere else that sends that analog voltage over here. 
in this reaches over goes through a couple of op amps over here and there's a read switch in here which i suspect and then it goes through some other op amp and ultimately goes into this one these two are also involved but i think this first module is responsible for the focusing and there are some protection circuitry at the output of these which is normal when you do have a very high voltage power supply you want to make sure that you absorb any potential sparks that could be happening and don't pass them to the tube and this is a tube x-ray tube connector that those are the only connections required aside from the high voltage to actually run the tube so if you look at this what could be the problem well the read switch is in series in some way with respect to the voltage that controls the focus the focus has to go through the read switch and this read switch can be turned on and off via i guess some digital bit that comes from the other board so if the read switch is intermittent sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work it could explain why it goes from being completely out of focus to all of a sudden in focus meaning that the read switch maybe makes connections after some time the other potential problem is this high voltage power supply. Now these are pretty flat, but this one does seem to have a bit of a bulge on it. Now this could be just process variation, manufacturing variation there, or it could be that there's something wrong with this one. And the problem with this is that sometimes these high voltage power supplies, when they are at the end of their life, or maybe they have some problems, they don't ignite, and they don't essentially fire up. And maybe after some time it warms up, or just occasionally, just eventually actually catches on, it does work. And since you have to turn it on and off between taking pictures, it might be that that's the problem. So these are my two guesses right now. All the other semiconductors, well, they either work or they don't. Intermittent semiconductor, yes, it can happen, but it's not very common. So I'm going to try the most obvious things. The read switch is really easy to replace. I found a replacement already. These things are available. You can easily buy them for a few dollars from eBay, for example. So we'll put a socket in here, remove this, and replace it nonetheless. And then we can remove this completely from the board and just run it ourselves and see if it works at all by applying a DC voltage in and measuring the output and see if we can do anything about this if not we'll have to see if we can buy a replacement or at least repair this one i'm more inclined to think that you have to buy one because these are all potted and quite difficult to take apart so we have a few things at least we can try let's start with the read switch and then take this through and here's our setup to measure and see if our high voltage module actually works i've taken it out of the board so this way it doesn't interfere with everything else that's there and we can run it essentially on its own it's a very simple device it's a dc multiplier which has active circuitry inside. So we have a DC voltage coming in over here, and the output is going to be all the way up to 1.7 kilovolts if this thing works. And I have connected it to two things at the same time. First, it's connected to this active probe, which is the Tektronix THTP0100. I've done a teardown and repair of this in a different video. I've also repaired the 200 model of this as well, and they have slightly different specification. Both of them are interesting for you to watch if you like these kind of probes. And that goes into our Tektronix 4 series, allows us to measure the waveform coming out of this, make sure it's stable, make sure it reaches the voltage that we want. Now at the same time, I've also connected it to this analog meter, which is the model 630. This is one of the very few analog meters that has its own 6 kilovolt breakdown at its input, which is great. The reason I connected it to this is because it will act as a safe load onto this. This thing has a much smaller input impedance that the probe does. Allows us to load this a little bit because this is supposed to provide some power. I think it can do about one or two milliamp. This is not going to load it that much, but nonetheless, it's going to apply something so that we are not just measuring ghost voltages. Now, at the input of this, we're going to use an SMU all the way over there. The nice thing about using an SMU here, the QT SMUs allow you to very quickly program ramps and other kind of things inside so we can really stress this thing and find out if it is working. And we're going to take a look at the screen of the Tektronix 4 series. Let's see what it does. Okay, let's give it a try. So I have programmed the Kitley 2460 to generate a linear ramp going from 0 to 12 volts and back down to 0. I'm going to enable it. And let's see what it does. Here we go. And look at that. That is a beautiful thing. It is generating the waveform exactly as expected. Now it does have a bit of a dead zone at the bottom, but that's normal because you do need some voltages at the input of this before the boost converter can start firing up and actually operating. So there is some dead zone, that's normal. That's what the data sheet also says. Look at these nice little steps. These steps are exactly the steps that the SMU is applying because there's a certain number of points. It's going by po 0.25 volt steps and it seems to be fully functional. I don't see any issues with it. It's a very nice linear ramp. It is indeed doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Now I can let it run for a while and we can monitor it. Here we can also see the, the needle of course move up and down very nicely without any issues and the voltage is correct over here you can read the voltage you can see how high it goes it will go up to about 1.7 kilovolts or so which is what we were expecting as well so i can't see any issue with it at least when i've taken it out and connected it on its own it is doing what it is supposed to 
Okay, well, that's one thing out of the way. And here's our replacement read switch sitting in the socket this time, so it's easy to remove and replace in the future. Now we have to put the entire machine back together before we can test it. Okay, so the machine is back together to a safe situation, and I want to make sure that the tube voltages haven't been affected by what we've done. So I'm measuring here the tube voltage. Right now it's 0 volts because there is nothing active, and here you will be able to see what the machine is supposed to be set to. I'm going to take an image here. There's nothing inside the machine, so the image is meaningless. And let's see what happens. So, what do we have here? And look at that, that's pretty well calibrated, 25 kilovolts, 2.5, you have to here multiply that up, and it is indeed where it's supposed to be. But I also want to measure the current of the tube. The current of the tube should not exceed 300 microamp. So we're going to switch those to the current measurement, and we're going to try again. And that's perfect, 0.299, so it's 300 microamp, almost spot on. So I think everything from the tube's operation is still consistent. And the question is, will it produce a sharp image? Okay, so here's the moment of truth. Let's say we want to take a look and see what's inside of this package. There's going to be a die with some wire bonds, and the wire bonds are of course quite fine. Can we resolve them nicely if the x-ray is in focus? Let's try it. I'm going to take a fully automatic picture. Now, although you can set the actual energy and the duration of the image manually, you can let the software decide what to do. And the way it works is that it takes an image at 26 kilovolts for about three seconds or so, and then analyzes the contrast and it determines how much exposure is required. It's kind of like a taking a one simple image and then figuring out what would be the best dynamic range for a full image. Okay, I decided to do something around 12 seconds at 35 kilovolts, which is a lot. I think the package is quite thick and there must be a lot of metal in there. Let's see now, here's the moment of truth. Ah, look at that. I think that looks pretty good. Yes, you can see the individual wire bonds very nicely. Let's uh, look at it 100% here. Oh yes, that is a great image. Definitely everything is in focus. That's good. This is a huge difference to what it used to be. These lines are very, very thin, so we're resolving them really nicely. That's great. I'm really happy about that. So let's take a couple of fun images so we can take a look at a couple of interesting items around the lab. And here's the image, look how nice it looks. All the wire bonds are beautifully shown. You can see the silhouette of the dye here and the glue that's used at the back of the dye, perhaps maybe some silver epoxy. Silicon itself doesn't absorb too much x-ray, so the majority of the absorption here is done by the ground plane that's on the other side and basically holding the dye in place. It looks really good, everything is nice and in focus. Now here's an example of a PCB I quickly took. This is a multi-layer PCB with some Wi-Fi antennas on it. And you can see all the interconnects in the different layers, the connection with the USB port, some of the text nicely in focus. And here's the actual read switch uh, X-ray, which I suspect is was the problem why this wasn't working in the first place. And the read switch structure is now super obvious. So this line over here goes into this coil. This coil is what creates the magnetic field, and it goes into this side. And that what switches the read switches themselves. And you can see the capsules of the reeds. The two sides of the capsules are quite visible. There's two of them in here. So this filament goes, in this element goes all the way through, and then there's a disconnection there which you cannot see because of all the metal of the coil, and it comes out on the other side. And when you apply the magnetic field, the metals bend and they touch each other. And there's two of them inside one package, doing two different things probably in this circuit, and one of them must have been the issue why we couldn't get uh, images in focus, at least after some time. When you turn this on and off, eventually it perhaps was making a connection. And here is an x-ray of a remote control. This is a little tiny remote control from my camera. The text here that you see is etched onto the metal of the PCB. Really nicely visible, super sharp lines. It looks really good. And here's last, this is an AirPod, an Apple AirPod. You can see all the structures inside of it, all the ribbon cables that going in different directions. This is the charging port over here and the silicone cone that you put in your ear and a little window for, uh, for various things such as getting the air in and out for the base, as well as the noise cancellation microphone and everything else. Very, very complex structure inside such a tiny space. So I think that the X-ray machine works now, which is great because we're going to need it for a lot of future videos. And I hope you enjoyed this real quick repair here. I've been away from uh, my desk essentially for some time. That's why I haven't made a video. But please do check the channel for a lot of videos that are already there. I'm working on future ones. Let me know what you think of this. I'll see you next time.